Welcome to Profiles in Risk with your host, Tony Canyons, and this is episode, I don't know, 205, I think, 204, 205, something like that. And today we have uh, with, with us Mark Workman and... Matt Workman. Ah, so close. Matt. And I, I was about to say, for once, I actually will correctly pronounce somebody's last name because it's an easy one. Uh, you got Workman. <laughs> and I get the name wrong. Matt Workman with... Uh, yep. with, with, I don't, I like, it's, it's so weird to me that you're actually related to, to insurance that, I, that, that with Airbus, with Airbus defense and space, yeah. uh, how you're related how does to, that all to happen? Ex exactly. That, that is exactly <laughs> Basically the topic of the podcast today is how you're related to insurance <laughs> because today we're going to yeah. talk about, about your career and kind of the crazy steps it's, it's taken uh and i i, I met uh, matt at insurtech connect 2018 and actually i have to ask him exactly where, where i met him uh in in vegas uh so we're both alumni of, of, of the conference and uh we happened to connect on my obsession with my virtual reality setup and we happen to live in columbus ohio both of us now i live in atlanta but we both live in columbus ohio so i kept bugging him to to come check out my my, my uh virtual reality setup which unfortunately never happened. Yeah, I kept stepping you. Uh, <laughs> no worries. No, no, no worries. Not on purpose. So, so at the time, it, when, when I met you at, at, at ITC, you were working for, for a provider. Drone base. To, to the, for drone base. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. So, so let's, let's pull it back because, because sure. your career really shows kind of one of the many crazy paths that an insurance career can take. Right? Mm -hmm. So... So, so you graduate with a degree in, in business management and you fall into a claims role right, right there in Ohio with, with EBS. What, what is EBS? Yeah. Well, let me take you back to that. So the cool thing about, um, you know, growing up with a father that was an agent, I got oh, okay. the whole, you know, immersion into the insurance world. So my father actually ran a TPA on the health and life side for you know, 30 years, 30 plus years. And so I grew up in the business and the transition from, you know, like graduating high school, going into college was this whole, like, where do you take your path? Where do you want to go? I went down the business management path. I, I there was 20 different things, you know, as there any college kid going in, where am I going to go? Um, the cool thing is my father wasn't like, you know, Hey, you've got to do insurance. You've got to do insurance, go figure out your own path. Um, but what I was able to do is, you know, a couple years into college, I, you know, was dinking around doing a few different things, odds and end jobs, uh, and still doing some things for him in the summers and part time at the TPA. And that's where I started processing claims, started kind of getting my feel for insurance. And, and this, again, was on the health and life side, not what I'm, I've been doing in my tech side, which is PNC. And really looking at, you know, it was just kind of interesting, unbundling ICD-9 codes and understanding all the different line items that go into a claim, uh, a health claim, and, yeah, and being able to apply benefits. And you just start kind of immersing yourself. And I started enjoying it. And I'm like, okay, maybe this is what I want to do when I graduate. Maybe I want to totally go into it. I went ahead and got my license. So that way I, you know, started learning and understanding. So I got my health and life license first. And shortly after got my PNC license. Uh, I was probably a sophomore in college when I did both of those. And then uh, just kept processing claims and doing some menial tasks through the uh, TPA during college off and on. Uh, when I graduated, um, I had, you know, a significant interest in going into sales. And that's kind of where my sales career took off and you know, kind of what's brought me to where I'm at today. So yeah, that whole growing up in the insurance world, kind of fighting it, kind of resisting it. And I actually almost did it again later, <laughs> but uh, you know, you kind of go down that path of, you know, ex exploration, you dive into insurance, you start enjoying it. And then it kind of took me forward to where I'm at today. So you, you, you did the, the I'm seeing on your, on your LinkedIn that you did, you did the sales piece uh, with the agency for almost 10 years, just about 10 years. Yeah. It's very rare. Like, like there's a lot of former insurance agents. They generally were an insurance agent for a year or two 
and yeah. didn't love it, couldn't quite figure it out, uh, and they ended up going elsewhere. Uh, but rarely, like if somebody actually builds a book, right? If they if they did for ten years, they don't leave. So, what, <laughs> uh, what led you to to uh, to go ahead yeah. and, and 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 go to Vertifor after? Like, like what, why leave your a book you've built? Yeah. So you know, short answer was I was just super interested in the operational side of uh, of the insurance industry. So. The cool thing is, of course, I mean, I took advantage of everything growing up and being able to work for my father during those years is, you know, the young guy in the agency was also the tech guy in the agency who was in charge of doing a lot of the, uh, you know, bringing in new software and exploring the market, evaluating different vendors, things like that. So I was in the early phases. I brought in a claim system, was like kind of on the forefront of our new claim system and implementing that, doing all the training doing all the workflow alignment, and et cetera. And then a couple of years in, I, I implemented a, a, like a health and life specific CRM that I found a firm on the Chicago, worked with them. We developed it together. I just really got into that side of the business. My father uh, in about 2010-ish decided that he was getting towards, I mean, retirement was there, was knocking on the door. And I was at a situation where I was kind of thinking, I'm young enough in my career where I've done well, I've learned a ton, I've made good money in sales and been able to get where I'm at. But I always had this itch on the operational side of things. Like, where do I want to go? And that, where do I really want to take my career? And he had the opportunity to sell the business, sell the book. So guess what? Sold the book, sold that. He goes off into the sunset and I start my next part of my career, right? And so uh, we had used, and I had mentioned earlier when we were talking, we, I had gotten my PNC license. I actually started our PNC division, which was me. Oh, so, right. so what I would life, do. It was a, a life agency. So, yeah. You opened, okay, that, that, that's interesting. I have yeah. to anybody who, who did it that way, okay. Yeah, so what we did is we would go in and sell the benefit plan to an, you know, an employer. You know, most of our employers were somewhere in that 200 to 500 employee range. Uh, go in, sell them, you know, their benefit plan, but then start talking to them about rounding out the relationship and looking at, you know, their, their property risk and, you know, their fleet risk or whatever the case may be and utilizing that PNC uh, uh, license to go out and start exploring. So we, we had a couple uh, of outlets brokerages that we would work through to get our, um, you know, affiliations with the appropriate carriers and write the PNC risk. And so that's where I kind of got my start. But when we did that, we actually purchased Rackley, which was the AMS 360 system at the time. So I had my kind of familiarity with Vertifor from that. And then when this all kind of happened, I saw, you know, you, know, you and I were talking about traveling. My wife and I love Boulder, Colorado, and voila, Vertifor had an opening in Boulder, Colorado. <laughs> and it tied to AMS 360. And I'm like, well, let's see. And it, everything worked out. I got an opportunity to move to Colorado for a while and uh, take that all in. And um, yeah, that's how I kind of transitioned into that space. So it, it all kind of ties together that way. That, 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 that makes sense. I, I had missed the cities since you're, since you're in Columbus now, in, in Ohio now, and you're in Ohio. Then I assume that you were just in Ohio the whole time. Okay, that, that, yeah. that, 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 that makes sense because that, that is definitely a, a reason that, that – successful agents do make a move is, is uh, they can't take their book with them if they, if they move and they geographically right. want to go somewhere else. Uh, okay. Yep. So, so, so that makes sense. So, so you see an opening with, with Vertifor, you, you like their software. So you're, you're already familiar mm -hmm. with them and, and you're like, awesome, let's go to Colorado. Okay. So, so you, you, so, okay, so, so Vertifor and you're the, the account manager for the Northeast. That's yeah, not Colorado. So <laughs> yeah, not Colorado at all. So I was getting up at, you know, 430 in the morning, driving to the office. <laughs> I was in at 6am. So that way I could, you know, catch the eight, eight o'clock, 830 in the morning uh, shift and uh, start doing doing my role. And that was, it was, it was interesting. So, you know, for me, you know, and, and obviously, this is a career path conversation. And the, there's a lot of good that I've talked about, but there was a huge struggle with this move in the fact that I went from being an agent 
and you know, you're talking about one thing, but you're definitely not talking about software and you're shifting gears and you're, you're trying to think a bit differently and you're trying to put yourself in, in uh, you know, into that customer's uh, shoes, but yet you're really not. <laughs> so it's this, this whole thing of trying to learn how to adapt and also too sitting in a cubicle in an office in Boulder, Colorado, where as an agent, you're, you know, it's a little bit different, right? Uh, especially in a family agency where you're not sitting in a cubicle all the time. Uh, so there was, there was a lot of struggle in those early phases, kind of getting a cadence, understanding uh, how software sales work. Um, you know, the first three months were brutal. Uh, but then, you know, you get that first deal. I remember, I remember still who it was, what the, co- the product was. I actually remember the struggle of getting that deal done uh, and just everything tied to it. And then once that happened, it was like, boom, it, yeah, it just kind of opened everything up in your mind and you started going, okay, this is how it works. And then you start rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat. And um, yeah, uh, the last, you know, probably, oh, in that role that I was in, I was in it for about another year um, until I got promoted. But um, it was just hitting my numbers after that good successes, enjoying the process, but it took that first one to get over the edge. So I imagine that a bunch of people who, who, who listen to us uh, have flirted with the idea of software sales, especially, especially sure. of going to a vendor or to an insure tech uh, and, and, and selling to the industry. Uh, so, so what, what's, what's the advice you, you, you have for that? Like, what, what are like the top three things that, that you recommend for, for a, so somebody making, making that move, going, yeah. to, going from insurance into software sales? Well, the one thing that I, the very one, the first lesson I learned was I came into it thinking, I know insurance. I was an agent. Just go do this. It's going to be easy. Right. And also your peers will look at you a little differently as well when you're sitting in the cube, cube row or you know, whether now where it's more often remote, uh, your peers are going to look at you a little differently. And so I would encourage humble, be very humble, understand where you came from, but also know that you don't know a damn bit about the software side as you thought you may have. And so take an advice of those that you join the team, the team that you join, whoever, if it's one person or 10, and start figuring out how they've been doing things, what their day-to-day process looks like. Uh, start immersing yourself with the product line and then just start rolling with it. And start Just be vulnerable, I guess. Be human and be vulnerable at that point. Uh, but the thing that I learned early on is I couldn't hold on to that insurance. I guess, uh, you know, I'm an agent. I was an agent. You should talk to me because I, I know your problems. Uh, that, can be, that can be actually a turnoff, I found. Uh, early on being a little too proud of that fact. Uh, so that, that would be the biggest advice I have for anybody that's considering it. The other, um, be patient. I think the next thing is, it, it, I've seen people that, now I'm not the only one that I know that has done that transition. And a couple of those folks, just like myself, struggled in the early phases. Some, you know, as short of, you know, three months like I was, I know another gentleman that it took him almost a year and a half before things really started clicking. And thank God the employer gave him that year and a half to really kind of get ramped up and going. But, um, you know, be patient that it's going to come to you. It's just a matter of time, the matter of persistence and consistency day to day to be able to get there. Okay. Okay. So, so, so you, you spent almost two years in Boulder uh, and then back to Ohio. So, so yeah, what was this? My wife got pregnant. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, family, all that stuff. And I had an opportunity close, to close get, to you know, family, close to the in-laws, yeah. uh, free, free childcare. <laughs> free childcare. You can call it that, uh, okay. you know, cousins, all that stuff, aunts, uncles. So, okay. I mean, the vast majority of our family was here. So that's what drew it. And, um, so that'd have been 2012. Uh, the cool thing was that that was when I transitioned to going, fully remote was at that point. Oh, I was going to say, did they happen to have an opening in Ohio or, or so, so basically uh, you were I told the them where, where, on where, allowing where, me to do it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Got, got, gotcha. Gotcha. And I, I think that that's, uh, you know, for, uh, that's going to be, that, that was hard to do back in 2012, 2013 
uh, it's gotten easier and it's gonna be much easier going forward uh, now that companies have seen that remote works right during this whole right. uh, COVID issue that we're de dealing with this year. Um, okay, so, so, so basically you were at the point where, where, where they were cool with you moving back and, 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 and being remote. Okay, yep. uh, so, so you do about, about four years with, with Vertifor. Uh, mm -hmm. and then transitional over to CoreLogic, uh, another supplier to the industry. So that one looks like, like, like a normal successful salesperson tra transition, basically. They, they, That's all it really was, they, right? They I mean, offer. <laughs> there's, there's, there is that, right? And then there's curiosity, right? You've yeah. had, I've had, I had a really good four year run. And yeah, I will, like the one thing I always do, and everybody probably, I'm a bit of a Vertifor fanboy. Uh, for a number of different reasons, um, but it really kind of they gave me that first chance. Uh, I've got great relationships still with a lot of people that have been there and are still there today. Um, so it was really that was the hardest decision in any of my job changes that I've done in the software side that I ever had. And it was solely because of the relationships in that that org. I just absolutely love that place. Um, but the switch to CoreLogic was, yeah, of course, what you mentioned first and foremost. But then the other thing was the curiosity and growth opportunity. There was a side of the business that, you know, I started kind of understanding during my time at Vertifor, which was wrapped around more of the data side and understanding how that plays in. And unlike, you know, you know somebody coming in out of college uh, get, becomes an underwriter and goes down that path or starts going into the underwriting work path, I kind of had to learn it through, you know, a little bit here and there as an agent and then into the software side and then starting to figure out, okay, how does, you know, wildfire risk score apply to an underwriting uh, uh, capacity? And then how does valuation and all these different little items of data that CoreLogic possess, uh, you start kind of understanding it and getting your mind wrapped around it. And I thought it was an interesting opportunity to grow. So, yeah, that's, that's the nicer, fluffier part of everything other than, oh, it's just a pure sales thing and, and you got a better opportunity. For, 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 <laughs> for the listeners who, who work in sales or, or like the sales side, uh, if you're early in your career, you'll see this a lot. It, I, I see it a sure. lot with, with vendor salespeople uh, and I see it a lot with carrier sales managers. Uh, stay in the same territory, just change carrier every two or three years. Uh, where it's yeah. very unusual is actual is agents. Agents t tend to be to be more stable because it's hard to bring your book with you. Uh, but it is. But but uh, but yeah. So so that 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 one make, makes sense. Um, it's yeah. It's a few things, right? I mean, I think everybody uh, you'll find in a sales role on the software side too, and especially I've noticed it more and more in the last five years is with VC funding ramping up like it did in the early phases of InsureTech and some of the more mature companies that you see out there that are into their C rounds and et cetera, uh, those investors have very high expectations of what the, the company needs to produce. So what also happens too is when you crush your numbers one year and you've made you know what you wanted to make that year, then all of a sudden you get a 25% bump or a 50% bump to your number and you're like, okay, I busted my rear for 12 months to get here. And yeah, hey, I'm going to go for it. But then there's always, it, 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 unfortunately, what it does to people that move every two or three years in this role is um, it kind of opens your mind to be like, well, if I'm going to continue to make this type of money, how do I do it? And where do I do it? And sometimes things do pop up where it's like, okay, that is interesting. That is some place where I can continue to go forward. And I can continue to be successful in what I'm doing. So there is this whole little tug of war in the VC world that kind of plays into insure tech. You, you, you talked about, uh, people, about, about the sales goals. Uh, if you're a listener, if you're early in your career and you're looking at sales, uh, your sales goals, regardless of how successful you are this year, will never decline. Well, <laughs> if, they if, will if never you, go down. If you have a magical year <laughs> next year, your goal is magical times 1.25, right? Uh, so, so be prepared for that. It's just what it is. Uh, <laughs> I mean, the current state, think of a global pandemic, right? A global <laughs> pandemic. I can't do what I normally would do is go out, be on the road, be in front of customers, talking about my product. I'm doing Zoom meetings. And, mm -hmm. and, and by the way, they're going well, but it's still, it's an adaption. And my numbers did not change during this pandemic. They're still the same.
Absolutely, no. <laughs> exact same thing. Exactly, the, the numbers were 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 calculated with with the idea of of going to conferences and in person visits and all that and, and figure it out, right? <laughs> Uh, yeah. that's that's sales for you but 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 it's it's very it, the beauty of sales it's 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 very well rewarded uh and, and also we we get a lot of freedom if you're successful at it you get a lot of freedom uh, yeah so that's a, that's a really beautiful thing uh so 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 you do core logic for about two years a little bit over, over two years this this move uh, i think is 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 really interesting because mm -hmm. you go to appian which is not a right like 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 Vertifor and CoreLogic are, are, are both traditional insurance uh, providers. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, part of the insurance ecosystem. Appian is not right. Like like insurance. Right. It, they try, it, it, and they still are. But okay. Yeah. What what I'm saying is is it, they're not a largely insurance vendor or a traditional yes. insurance vendor, right? Like Vertifor and CoreLogic have been around for a long time. Uh, so so how. How, how did that move happen uh, to, to, uh, to well, Appian? It kind of, uh, and this will be a fun, uh, this will be part, probably when it'll get a little fun. So for me, this is when my curiosity itch began. This is that, okay, traditional companies, this is how it's done. What, like all the innovative things, right? Like Appian's big, um, you know, value is low code rapid application development being able to take your core systems and all the things that you've been running your business off of and build really fast deployable applications that can bolt onto the side of legacy systems and provide digital transformation that you're looking for. And so the things that I was seeing when I was going around in the Midwest at the time at CoreLogic is all these insurers that had, you know, our valuation and our risk uh, data going into their core systems and their core systems were antiquated as hell at that time. Continue and they still, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to, I'm sorry carriers. If there's anybody out there that's listening, I apologize for saying you got antiquated systems, but what I saw was, okay, antiquated systems, you got the duck, duck creeks, the guide wires and folks like that, that are providing these core systems. But Appian had this different mindset and I still, I mean, believe in it today is the fact that you can still have those core systems, but those core systems still are pretty rigid. There's things that you can't do to modify it to fit your organization and things you're wanting to accomplish. And Appian provides that. Appian provides you that flexibility to be able to go in and make your workflow your workflow and not Guidewire's workflow or Duck Creek's workflow. Yeah, you know, It's really, really um, flexible to what you want to achieve. Um, and so that was something appealing when they reached out to me, they were recruiting me during uh, the last, you know, three or so months when I was at CoreLogic and it just, it was very interesting. I, that's the, that's the part of me that gets all like, that's what took me from being an agent and going to the software side was I'm just interested in all, how these, all these things work and putting all these different widgets together. And, uh, uh, it, it piqued my interest and obviously it was financially, um, um, you know, incentivizing. And so, uh, yeah, that's what made that transition happen. And um, if you look, you know, there's, and I know what you're going to ask me, is it was a short run and then you went to drone base and then you went to drone base and you went to Airbus. The, the Appian situation, I, I almost still feel like had there, there was, I've got a mentor in my life that actually was the VP of sales at drone base. And he was the one that came to me. He's like, I need somebody to, that knows insurance to, start our program at drone base. Can you come over? And that's the only reason I left Appian. Super happy there, was enjoying it. I got great relationships there as well. Uh, John Verbert's one guy that um, I still to this day, uh, you see him at all the conferences at Sure Tech Connect. He's a very loud guy, tall guy, awesome guy. Um, I have just wonderful relationships with those people. And uh, yeah, that, that, was a, that was an interesting move. And that is where I feel with the Appian situation, I learned more about how an insurer operates than at any point in my career. Interesting. And yeah. And so that's when I think things started unlocking and different things in my mind started happening. And what I was really focused on at the time and when they brought me in is because I'm in Ohio, of course, Columbus, the home of nationwide, uh, and then Progressive being up in Mayfield Village, those were really my two accounts. They said, 
Matt, we want you to go to these two accounts and find, find opportunity. And I would, I I don't know how many meetings I I know, uh, you know, way more people than I'd like to imagine I ever would have at nationwide at the home office here. Uh, And they probably got sick of seeing me. Um, yeah, I, I was even on Friday mornings, I would go in and just have coffee in the lobby of the uh, of Plaza too, and just hang out. Like, <laughs> just here I am, you know, the redhead with the beard. You'll find me, you'll see me, and eventually you'll take my call. So, um, yeah, it's, it was one of those where you just, you had so many meetings, you saw so many different parts of Nationwide, you saw all the different product lines, you met with underwriting, you met with claims, you met with innovation, you met with the business leadership group you had all these different people that you were able to kind of get their perspective on uh, different product lines and where they were heading. It was really a neat experience. And Appian allowed me to not be so pigeonholed to a product, whereas Appian's pretty abstract. So you can talk about, well, is your policy rater working appropriately? Is that how you like your policy rater to work? Well, if it isn't, here's how we can help you. And here's how your claim system's working. Well, but is it working the way you want it? Here's how Appian can come in and provide additional I, value. That, that's, that, that, that's very similar to, to, to my, my favorite thing about, about, about my work at, at Jacobson is, is, is exactly that, 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 that we, we deal with all areas of insurance. So, so mm-hmm. I, I get to, to, kind of, to, to talk to underwriting, to talk to claims, to, and we're not talking systems, we're talking staffing. But, but, uh, but yeah, exactly. It, it, it really, I, I get to learn about what's going on in all the different areas as opposed to, to, you know, pe- people at, at, at whatever uh, provider who only work one, pro- one product, right? And all you do is call on claims or all you do is call on underwriting or, or right? Because mm-hmm. that, that's the product you work with. Uh, so, so it's, it's yep. that, that kind of generalist uh, sales role where, where you you get to know all the different areas of uh, of the company is, is is a lot of fun. You learn a lot. It is. You learn a lot, and I, you know if, if there's ever I, I hate to say this, and I'll I, you'll find me you know you and I a budding relationship, right? But you learn to find I'm I'm sometimes brutally honest to a fault. Um, I I as well have great respect for the folks at Drone Base, but I wish I'd have given a, a, Appian more time. Only because I wish if if there is some advice to folks uh, out there. Um, although I learned a ton at uh, at Drone Base, and uh, because I got to sit with my mentor for that period of time, uh, that was cool. But I wish I'd have just told him, eh, maybe call me in six months. <laughs> like you know, give me give me a little bit more time here. Uh, that would have been probably the better path, but. Um, it was definitely where yeah, I just learned so much. It opened my mind up so much to how insurers are really thinking about innovation in different levels too. You know, a nationwide, the way they innovate is completely different than even state auto just up the street or, uh, you know, in Covia or Grange, you've got four major insurers in this city With and all four of them are completely the different in their way that they think and operate towards their goals. And it's, it's kind of fascinating when you're going in and talking to all of them at those different levels and exploring kind of what they're, they're looking to achieve. It's all different. It's always different. Uh, but now they always want to know what the other one's doing, of course. You know, well, what are they doing? What are they doing? But at the end of the day, they still have their path. And it's kind of neat to be a part of that ecosystem and exploring and understanding what they're, what they're thinking about. Did you find, uh, so, so the, the drone based one, obviously drones. Yeah. Uh, Yep. Did, did, did you find uh, a lot of like the carriers actually biting when it, when it comes to, to, to drones or was it more like they're curious, but, but don't really not ready to, to actually dig in? Well, so um, when Terry brought me in, they had gotten, they had some success in insurance, felt that that was a place where they could start kind of getting their footing as a, you know, an insured, well, not even a, it, can't even call them an insure tech, quasi insure tech, a tech startup, right? And um, they they had a few customers. Um, what I when I came in, we kind of started. Th- I I brought what I knew about insurance, which was the idea of being able to understand the inspection process and the outside view of a property, the things that an insurer is looking for, um, um, being able to figure out what the flight plans look like, 
How would it fit into um, both the inspection from a cost perspective, but then on the claim side from a cost perspective, modeling out those programs and then going to market and, and uh, promoting that. So there was a lot of, the good thing is all the stuff that I learned, I was able to apply and start being able to help at that level. But then the next kind of struggle was to your point, the adoption, the mindset. A lot of people, especially when I joined there, were starting to get really excited about drones that had started becoming a hot topic at IT, ITC, at Dig In, all these different conferences you go, you'd see somebody up on stage flying a damn drone around a model house. There was all these things going on. Uh, so it was, it was still that insurers were struggling with the concept of, one, what am I seeing out of the imagery versus what would my adjuster see when they're out in the field at that property? Two, how do we, like, is this actually a threat to my adjusters and their expertise? Like, is this something that we want to bring in and then does that, you know, impact our folks that we've had for 20, 30 years doing this job that have all these, all this knowledge in their head that they can't, you know, they can't replace. The other is the, the end consumer, their comfort level with having somebody show up to their property, whether it's the adjuster or a drone based pilot who is not an adjuster, just has a, hopefully a drone based shirt or a drone based colored shirt, not a tank top and flip flops when they show up. But they, you know, having an individual show up at your house and fly a drone around it, collect imagery and then leave it, There was a lot of kind of getting insurers over that hump. Now we had a few that, you know, I, I think we had in the time that I was there, I think we signed up just shy of 20. I think we we're at 19 different insurers across the country that we were able to get in that period of time. Um, the, but again, it, the issue that we had towards scaling that business was always that insurance had a trepidation on that, that end customer interaction and the adjuster interaction and how it correlated. The other problem with drone based too is it was just providing images at the time. Now they have some solutions. They had the, the relationship with better view where they purchased a chunk of their technology to be able to get better. Um, and now they're, they're providing some assessment returns off of the imagery, but even still, it's going to be really hard now and in the future to replace what that adjuster or that inspector actually knows and can bring back to the insurer versus just a bunch of images from a drone. Um, the other problem too, that I think we all, we all know is hail. So hail damage being the Holy grail that it is AI machine learning still is nowhere near where it needs to be to be able to identify hail never will be. And even off of drone imagery, you, I mean, as granular as drone imagery is, you still really can't accurately determine size, diameter, depth, numbers. You get pretty close, but it's never 100% accurate. And what are most of the roof damage claims that insurers run into? <laughs> so if you're going out as an adjuster and you're relying on drone imagery and it's not really returning much of an answer and you could have just got on the roof and been able to determine that yourself, that's the other hurdle that I've seen. So. Interesting, 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 and and so so you go to drone drone base to, with your mentor there for yeah. about a year, and then you you make the weirdest move I have ever seen. I I I, I, think, <laughs> I, I I think that I congratulated you, and I was like, "Are you leaving the industry?" Like, <laughs> yeah, I was, think I got that a lot. Uh, of, of, of things, you weren't the only uh, one. So. Uh, <laughs> It was taking drum base further. You okay. don't even know. So, <laughs> so there was a couple of things, right? I was at that point in my career, right? You're successful in different sales roles mm -hmm. and you're always looking to challenge yourself another way. And Airbus offered me the opportunity to lead a team. So that was one reason. Uh, so Airbus uh, had a sales team in Atlanta where you're at now and uh, over in Pont City Market. Uh, the, the, the division was called Ponte, uh, or Airbus, Airbus Aerial. And Airbus Aerial was, uh, at the time, and, uh, a, uh, had developed a platform that takes all three forms of aerial imagery. Uh, the satellite imagery, manned aircraft in, imagery, and drone imagery, and brings it all into one platform. So that way you can take all those different aerial assets and be able to get a complete picture of property, right? And so, hence, there's the applicability to insurance, right? Okay. I, I, yeah. So, so, yeah. So, the fact that it has the Airbus name 
is is weird. that's what throws everybody off. Exactly. And, <laughs> and no one knows that Airbus owns satellites. That, so okay. that's the yeah. other thing that throws everybody off. <laughs> so whenever you're like, oh, satellite imagery, oh, where do you get that? Planet Maxar? No, it's ours. Oh. Really? Yeah, so yeah so, no, we, we have satellites. So if it was owned by Airbus, but it had an insure techie name related to, right, global view or, right, th then it would have been like, oh, yeah, like, like makes perfect sense. It's just a, a, a step up from Roadmates. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's the Airbus name that, that, that makes it really weird. I, makes sense. Exactly. And, and yeah. So, so you, you have, I just realized, you've been uh, a remote uh, sales leader for sales over leader. eight years now for eight years that so so well yeah. ahead of 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 a lot of people so 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 i think that this is going to be uh super important going forward because well right now Very right we're, we're recording in, in the middle of 2020 of 2020 everybody's remote right now in our, in our industry or just about everybody uh, i believe that going forward even after we have a vaccine uh we're gonna see a lot more remote because the carriers are getting comfortable. Why not? With it, right? Like, it's right. like you can't put this, well, this genie back in the We just talked about nationwide, right? Nationwide's closing so, down brick and mortar, putting people, even more people remote. I mean, so, it, it makes sense. So, so, so having been re successfully remote for eight years, uh, what, what advice do you, do you have for, for uh, newly remote professionals to, and, and, and especially sales professionals? to, to uh, stay productive and, and, and uh, make it work? Uh, uh, consistency. Treat it like you're going to work, like still like you're going to a brick and mortar building. Get up in the morning, do your routine. Now granted, I'll, I'll be very honest. I sleep a lot better than when I used to go into an office. <laughs> it, it's, that part's nice. Uh, but, you know, instead of getting up at 5 a.m., I get up at 6 a.m. You get up at 6 a.m., you do your routine. Keep it just like you're going to the office. Get up, take a shower, do your normal routine. And then at whatever time, the nice thing with sales, right, is there's days where I start my day at 6.30. There's days when I start at 9, depending upon schedule and the things that I'm doing that day. If I know I'm going to be flying somewhere, et cetera. But consider or you know continue to keep it consistent and keep it like you're going to the office at first it's so hard to to close a door or eliminate distractions and me now tony when you and i first met i had just had my second kid now i've got three and i'm at home and of course with covid you know my oldest is you're in school she, yeah. yeah my wife's homeschooling uh, you know, the other two, you know, an infant and a, a toddler running all over the damn place. And so being able to know that from eight to five or nine to six or nine to four, whatever the case may be, that you can get very consistent in your morning approach to be very locked in during that, the heart of the day to be able to do what you need to do. Um, so I, I mean, I've been in those eight years, I've had offices you know, in the you know, different homes that I've lived in, um, you know, in the basement, uh, in, in a corner of a, of a spare bedroom. And, you know, you make it look like an office behind you. And then you, know, you just kind of, you, you do all you can to feel like you're going into an office. And then I remember when I moved, when we moved into this house, very first thing I walked in the door and my door, my front door is right here. Come in office. I'm like, yep, I'm good. It's got an office, Doors, close the whole thing off, and I can see the world. So, you know, definitely make sure that you're consistent. Make sure you have a dedicated space. It makes you feel like you're actually working and you're locked in. And then um, I think do all you can to distance yourself from the distractions. But also the last thing, the last bit of advice is treat it again like you're leaving work. Don't keep it until 9 o'clock or 8 o'clock. Don't get done with dinner and then come into your office because you remembered an email or two. Um, especially I, I think when you're single or you're, you've got a girlfriend and that's a little easier to be able to do, but when you start having a wife and kids and you start kind of going that path, um, it makes it really important to lot, you know, really shut down and dedicate that time and focus with your family. So that's the other thing you need to learn how to unplug when your office is like 10 feet from, <laughs> you know where you're normally at roaming around your house so and and the last few roles you, you you've had now you're you're 
you know, kind of managing teams. Uh, so yeah. What, what, are, what advice for, for managers who, who now have remote teams? Yeah, right. So I, I think the biggest thing, is, well, it's tough. Uh, I mean, in sales, uh, because it's like, you know, I grew up playing sports and you had to trust the person to your right, the person to your left. Especially, I always kind of equate a lot of my things to football because that was my big sport growing up. And you always had to trust, like, if you know, your guard, your tight, your tight end, your tackle, your center, to be able to execute and be where they need to be on every single play. And when you're, when you're, when you're building those relationships and you're being able to build trust, a lot of that's done face to face. That's done after hours at a happy hour. Like I, when I took the job and was down in Atlanta. I was taking people and we were like, okay, let's go have lunch. Let's go grab a drink after, after, after work, this, you know, this grab dinner since you're in town or, you know, Hey, this do this or that you're building that camaraderie. You're building that trust. So that way, rather than what I have found. And I, I mean, I've had leaders where when I've worked with them, you never, in, especially in the early phases, if, if you didn't have that breakdown of where you had a trust, we didn't have to be best friends, but a trust level, it was really hard to be open about what's in my pipeline. What are the opportunities I'm working on? You always felt like you were selling the, the sales manager on what you're, you're, you're doing. Uh, and that's stressful is living hell when you're doing that because you, you feel like you're always fighting yourself and you're fighting the market and you're fighting towards a number. So for folks that, especially now being remote, it is critical. If we ever open up, spend as much time getting to know your people. You don't have to be best friends. Get to know them at a human level, know their kids, know their wife, know their, you know, their significant other. It doesn't matter. Just get to know them, build that trust. So that way you can be successful together. You can work through deals together. You can talk openly, honestly, that, that sales rep can be very frank with you about product, about features, about, you know, customer support needs, those things need to be fluid. And when there's no trust, those, those lines of communication break down. So I think what I've been doing and, you know, you know, through COVID and everything is I make sure that the folks that I work with that are part of my team is we talk, we just communicate probably even more than we did before. Uh, you know, it's a zoom meeting. It's hey, you know, just a slack, a real quick slack, or, Hey, this make sure that we're talking every day. There's just, communication. And it's not me micromanaging. It's not me doing any of that. It's, you know, what can I help you with? What are you doing? How, what barriers can I break down for you? Let's get that deal done. What, what do we have to do to move forward? So that's, that's the, the biggest one is that trust in the early phases, once the world opens up, but even right now doing all you can to build that trust and build those relationships with the people that are working for you. Right. Uh, you know, my success is obviously tied to what they do. Absolutely. So the, uh... I, I, I agree completely. I, and, and I'm not a, a manager and I, I'm at the point in my career where I, I, I avoid manager level manager type roles. I very much like being an individual contributor. Uh, but, but, uh, I, I agree that, that leaders that take the time to, to, to get to know you and, and uh, to let's go out to dinner when you're in town. Uh, it, it, mm -hmm. that relationship is, is absolutely huge to actually, uh, being able to, to, to perform and, and, and being able to, to go to them when, when they're, when, when yes. they need a roadblock removed, uh, th that, that kind of thing. So, so that, that, that makes a ton of sense. Uh, so, so this being been, human, right? Just being human. I, this, the, 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 the hierarchical barriers that I've got, like I've had, I'm not going to say of course name who, where, what. But I've had a couple in my career where you're just like, no matter what, they don't care. They don't care how your day went. They don't care. And immediately you're just like, I don't want to talk to you right mm -hmm. now. If I, you know, it, it's not a healthy relationship and it makes it really hard for people to stay incentivized, stay sticky with the organization, all those types of things. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. This, this has been a, a really fun one because it, 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 your career really illustrates the, uh, crazy directions that an insurance career can take, especially today where we have this bigger than ever world of vendors because of the investment in, in insure tech. And there's so yeah. many different, uh, like it's always been a great career, but now it's even better because there's so, there's so many different directions you, you, you can go in. Uh, so it, it's, it's great to see what, what, what you've done and, and, uh, 
I, I think that the listenership will will really benefit for, from it. So so uh, uh, thank thank you for for being available to to, to chat. Uh, yeah. Hopefully we we get back on a plane here someday. You know, early twenty twenty one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the next time you're in Columbus, we'll we'll have to catch up. You know, go to a. What, 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 I always find it funny. So before we depart, like every time folks come to Columbus, they're like, where do you go eat? And it's funny with Columbus, right? Is it's like, not really a foodie town. <laughs> like there's some places, but it's always so hard. It's like, oh, you know, you go to Atlanta, you go, oh, we're going to go here. You go to New York, oh, let's go here. Or what, Boston or whatever. Chicago, of course. You come to Cle- or Columbus or even Cleveland for crying out loud. Uh, it's like, where do you go? Well, uh, you got Donato's. We got, uh, oh, wait a minute. We got North Star. We got North Star. Short, That's where we could go. Short North has the short North has, has, a, has a good amount of food. They Person, yeah. per, per, personally, uh, my, my advice uh, uh, and in insurance, Columbus and Des Moines happen a lot. Uh, in, 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 in Columbus uh, is Happy Greek in, in the short North. Yes, Happy Greek's excellent. Really, really excellent. Every time, uh, I've never had anybody complain about Happy Greek. Uh, and in 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 uh, Des Moines, uh, uh, Zombie Des Moines. Uh, so I, yes, yeah. So I don't know if if you end up in Des Moines now, nowadays. Uh, I have, but, but not for a couple of years. Yeah, but yeah, Zombie Burger. Uh, so for for the insurance capitals, for those two insurance capitals in Hartford, I, I've been there a couple of times, but I wouldn't know where to t- take you. Uh, but but those two, uh, Happy Greek. Oh, won't sure. Let, won't, let you, won't, won't, won't let you down. Uh, so yeah. great chatting with you. Uh, happy Friday. You as well, Tony. We're recording at, uh, at 4.50 p.m. on, on a Friday. So yeah. enjoy your weekend. Uh, yeah. And thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, appreciate it, man. Uh, awesome. Anytime.